live from Palo Alto, California, it's The Cube at Pier 2.0. Brought to you by the Pier 2.0 Foundations. Learn, connect, and grow. Now here are your hosts, John Furrier and Jeff Frick. Hey, welcome back everyone. We're here live in Silicon Valley for The Cube. This is our flagship program. We go out to the events, extract the signal noise. I'm John Furrier, the founder of Silicon Valley. I'm joined by my co-host Jeff Frick, and, and we are at the Pier 2.0 event, uh, day two, wrapping up here on an amazing event, inaugural event for the group. Huge success. Uh, not huge numbers in terms of uh, um, audience, but very small kernel of experts and gurus really setting the agenda going forward. Our next guest is Keith Mitchell, uh, president of DNS OARC, uh, the operations side underneath the DNS, global viewpoint. Welcome to theCUBE. Thank you, Joe. You know, theCUBE, we always love the global perspective and obviously the DNS is running the internet, right? So a lot of traffic controls through DNS. Um, operations is an interesting term. The word DevOps we've been covering on the cloud takes a more development focus around operations. Um, and, but developers, they, they make a lot of errors, agile programming, ops is, doesn't like to tolerate errors. So some people say ops dev. So operations and developers working together seems to be an oil and water situation. How do you view the, the state of the current communities coming together? Because you have the two collisions of the two worlds, the developers, software developers, and the ops guys. Is there harmony there? Well, that's an interesting question because when I started my career with software engineering, you know, and I was writing TCP IP code 20 plus years ago, and I discovered very quickly that I am a terrible programmer, um, but I'm actually pretty good at network operations. Um, so I would be kind of wary of somebody who said they were good at both. Um, there, there, there are distinct skill, skill sets there. Um, so I've done my time in network operations and now what I'm trying to do is um, help facilitate education, um, transfer of knowledge, distribution of clue um, within the internet operations community in various forms. Describe that in a little bit more detail. Drill down on, on that distribution piece. What is it all about and what's the key, key points? Um, I think that it's about running the infrastructure, finding models for running the infrastructure that work, um, defining the processes, um, finding the talent and facilitating the ways and we make the, 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 the talent work. Um, and then organ building the infrastructure, not just in terms of the routers and the switches and the servers, but also building the infrastructure in terms of the organizations um, and making sure that these organizations are functional, they adhere to best practice, um, they are um, they're good for um, making sure the internet works effectively. What's the critical success factor for these young guys coming in? Because education, people are starved for education. There are new recipes, new formulas, new network architectures, you've got virtualization, you have large scale networks that are developing fast. What is the key issue that people are most interested in? Um, I think that you know, today's event about, is about being about peering, um, and peering is like the secret sauce that holds the internet together. Um, and um, there is a bunch of best practices and a bunch of people um, who have been doing this peering for a long time. And um, we've learned some pretty good things, um, but we're not perfect and we're in a very dynamic and moving landscape. So I think it's very important not just to preserve the knowledge that we have, but also make sure that the processes and the structures that we've put in place are open to the innovation and the changes you know, that come with social media and the cloud, which are things that 20 years ago we had, we had, we had no idea of. Um, so um, it's, it's, it, you know, we're, we're building something for the ages here. It's not just um, this week or this year or the past decade. Yeah, and it's interesting when we were talking a little bit before we started, you know, you said that this is the internet secret sauce and that the, you know, the really the number of people uh, that really know how it works and are making it work and driving it is a relatively small group and that, you know, the purpose of Peer 2.0 is to start to get the education out to a much broader audience, to get the messaging out to a much broader audience. Where, where did that come from? Did, did people just wake up one day and say, oh my goodness, you know, there's just not enough of us? Or have the, have the demands of the network really forced the hand to say, we've got to get this out to a broader audience? Um, I think that um, there's always been a recognition that the knowledge needs to be shared. Um, I think that as we have seen 
everything evolve over the past few years, we've got to the point where, um, you know, I, I think that a lot of us are realizing, well, actually, um, we're in danger of some of this knowledge being lost. You know, we're seeing some of the people who we are, who are our mentors are starting to retire, and, you know, we're thinking, well, it's important that this is preserved. And the other side is there's huge demand for it. Um, I've been running UK Network Operators Forum for 10 years ago, that's for 10 years now, which is a, an organization that is equivalent of Nanog in the UK. And the last few meetings, we've been growing from 150 to 200 to 250 attendees, and that's, you know, that's just in a small country like the UK. There is, there is huge demand for this understanding of how do we make all this hang together? Uh, what is the glue that underlies all the social media and the cloud services, um, the critical infrastructure? Um, making sure that that's available and functional. And is that a, a function of, um, we talked a little bit about earlier about, you know, people are now peer-to-peer -peer direct, directly, you know, the ecosystem of the peering and, and of that core network, uh, internet is expanding beyond what it was before, just the tier one guys all peering together. Is, is it because you're seeing more interest from enterprises or, or companies that want this capability, or is it just pure growth within the infrastructure that's driving this demand? Um, I think that there is, um, there's not new um, players or traffic so much as um, everybody is realizing that more and more of everything that we do on particular businesses is reliant on the internet. Um, and it's about ensuring that the connections are more robust and resilient and controllable. I mean, one of the key things about peering is, is control over your own destiny. Um, so that if you've got another business that you're doing business to business interaction with um, and it's critical to both your businesses that that traffic flows um, and you do not want the cable company in the middle to start getting involved in network neutrality wars with your, your traffic or you're, you, you know, you're worried about a backhoe going through the single piece of fiber that, 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 that they may designate for your traffic. So by having your organization peer directly with the businesses that you have a critical relationship with you are um, having more control over your destiny. And that's exactly the way it's always been. Internet providers started peering, not just because they wanted to save money and reduce latency and to avoid traffic tromboning over international circuits and back again. They did it because they didn't want to be screwed by the guy upstream from them. They wanted control over their own destiny. When you peer, you can have much more control over where your internet traffic comes, comes to and goes from. Keith, talk about the um, opportunities in the future as we evolve now and have years and years of experience running large-scale networks. Um, as the world changes, you're starting to see more of a global landscape, certainly in the country-by-country -country basis. On the U.S., obviously it's here, but in North America, but outside of the North America, in the, in, in the uh, EU, for instance, obviously different Germany versus this, data is our issue. So, given the landscape of the global uh, agenda, what are the opportunities that you see for entrepreneurs and for, and for tech geeks because you know, we were talking just before you came on about some of the hard challenges that, to solve these problems are out there. So there's certainly problems to be worked on and that will yield to opportunities. What do you see? Um, well, you know, we, we, we have a huge concern in the internet industry, well, internet community at the moment about pervasive surveillance um, and nation states and other actors have been able to get their hands on your traffic nation states saying, oh, we don't want our traffic to go via this other country um, because it might get snooped by that country and we don't trust their interests. Um, by increasing the amount of peering and the way that it is understood, um, then you are, you know, you're never going to eliminate the bad stuff, but you're reducing the risk surface. Um, you know, the other thing that's going on this week is the, the DEF CON conference in Vegas where all the hackers and um, all the good guys and bad guys get together. Um, internet security is a huge threat. Um, it's not, I don't think that it's an insurmountable threat, but we need to do things that tackle that. And one of them is to have more control over our infrastructure and our traffic. Another is distribution of clue. You know, understanding best practice and in internet security is really important. We need to do a lot more in terms of internet security and protecting the infrastructure. Um, you know, my organization, DNSOARC, is very much about protecting the domain name infrastructure in the internet. Um, I think the other thing is that when we figure out models that have made the internet successful in our Western developed countries, it's also about helping advocate, not impose, but advocate these models um, to other countries. 
um, a lot of um, governments in developing countries do not want to encourage competition in the telecoms market because they see the incumbent PTT operator as um, being the, um, a cash cow. But actually, there have been circumstances now whereby developing neutral internet exchanges at which local and country peering can happen, that actually the cost burden of transit services to these countries, the cost of connecting to the rest of the internet has gone down significantly. Um, and you know there are huge opportunities for spreading the knowledge and the clue um, that, that, that we have learned about how to do this stuff um, to make sure that the rest of the world, you know, the other half of the planet's population that needs internet services um, can do so um, in a way that, um, that is effective um, and um, is not, you know, not, not, not subject to vested interests of using it. And then you've got the Internet of Things factor, right, which is coming fast and yeah. furious, which, which um, I don't know what your numbers are, but it, you know, it's going to you know, increase the devices, increase the potential, I, I like that phrase, risk surface significantly. Mm -hmm. um, you know, how much of that is a driver and how much of, of uh, are, are you able kind of as a standards committee organizations to get ahead of that curve? Well, to some extent, it's a bit frustrating because the, 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 the things that are desperately needed for the Internet of Things to work properly are things like IPv6 addressing, um, things like um, good security practices, um, low latency networks, um, networks that are transparent across not just the socket that's got your Internet provider, but across your entire building, you know, whether that's your home or your business. Um, so there are a lot of things that those of us who've been in the industry for a while have been advocating DNSSEC, IPv6, multicast. Many, many of these things are going to be absolutely critical in the security. All of these things are going to be really critical in the Internet of Things. I hope that we see the Internet of Things as an opportunity and motivation to um, go after all these solutions that have been looking for a problem for a while now. Keith, you had a uh, discussion um, on, and you talk on the power of interconnection cooperation. I had to kind of read that, it's a mouthful. Interconnection cooperation. Uh, just describe what that is. What, is, what does that mean? Um, you can connect to one other party on the internet and you can both say, well fine, we're going to peer or we're going to transit or we're gonna, I'm going to sell you my local loop service or something like that. Um, and that's fine if there's just two of you, and then if you start doing that relationship with three or four, then it starts to get very inefficient because you're duplicating the effort and the resources across each one of these relationships. Um, when you set up something like an internet exchange um, or a clearinghouse for data about the internet's domain name infrastructure, um, then you're gaining from the power of many to many. You know, you, you're building a community, everybody is bringing their own contribution to the table, um, you get a critical mass there. Um, quite often a side effect of that critical mass is you finish up with a marketplace uh, where people can buy and sell services from each other um, because it, it's no longer just a one-to-one -one relationship, it's a one-to-many relationship. What's your biggest thing that you, you want to share with folks out there that you've learned, that you see as a, that you get, or a question you get from, from folks that are either friends, customers, partners, in terms of the peering, because you know, peering is obviously a social thing as well as a, technical thing, what's the number one thing that you hear from folks around the challenges, opportunities, and advice that you give? What's the number one item? Um, that's an interesting question. I, I, again, I think it, it relates to security and protecting infrastructure quite a lot, which is you know, a little bit of a negative message, but as I say, it's, 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 it's a tractable yeah. problem. Yeah, and you need to solve that, it's a real issue. Yeah. Um, so... Um, How about governance? Uh, is that fact, does that hamstring the operation at all? I mean, obviously it's been very political, with, you know, certainly on the government side and with the global footprint of DNS now, there's no one single country that runs it. Yeah, I think, I think for governance, we, we've, defect, we've developed what I think is a 21st century model of running organizations. And I think a lot of the, um, shall we say, powers that be have not figured that out yet. Um, and when people say, oh, we should have the ITU running the internet instead of ICANN, they're, 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 they're trying to apply a 20th century governance solution to a 21st. It should be the other way around. We should be modifying, we should be modernizing the ITU so that it is more like internet governance structures. I mean, I um, just, I just so much going on with DNS, I got to ask you the question. The CCTLD was a very big part of the infrastructure because the you know, GTLDs were limited. So, uh, so now I just got uh, an email that said I could buy the domain John Furrier rocks dot rocks. 
um, dot guru. I mean, I mean, what is coming? Dot house. I mean, I mean, oh, there's yeah, so many the, the, GTLDs. The, the, I, I, mean, I, I was just it? reading last week that we are going to have the um, the dot WTF and the dot fill <laughs> top level domains. So, so yeah, yeah. I mean, so does that mean the CC? I, I think it means that our governance processes are not perfect, and <laughs> we still need to work on them. But what does that do to the CCTLDs? Does it change at all the dynamics? It used to be that was a very specific country specific. Does it change it? Does it flatten it? What's your take on this? Well, I mean, something that's happened that's been quite controversial recently is, is the .UK, um, the nominate organization that I was involved in founding. Um, they used to have like many versions of .co.uk for a British version of .com and .ac.uk for a British version of edu, and they've just flattened that all out. So you can get anything .uk now. Um, and I'm pretty clear that you know, they have been motivated to do this because they see the top level flattening out. Um, so oh, okay, we need to flatten out our national infrastructure as well. Um, and um, yeah, um, I think that there's scope for opening all this stuff out, but I think that there are also dangers of going too far. And, and I think you know, the other thing to understand about the domain namespace from my perspective is that People don't type domain names into their browsers or anymore. email addresses right, anymore. Right. They're using apps and search engines. That doesn't mean that the domain name service is irrelevant. It's, it's just going to become another, and you know, most people don't see IP addresses. In another five years, domain names will be an invisible layer in the protocol stack that people don't see, but is nonetheless completely mission critical to the internet. Which is why we built CrowdChat, which is going to be doing it for hashtags. <laughs> so the new <laughs> URL. Interesting. <laughs> um, Keith, thanks for coming on theCUBE, really appreciate it. And I want to give you the final word for, the, for this segment. Share with the folks out there what the vibe is for Pier 2 uh, What's it like here? Why is this inaugural event important? And, and, and what's your takeaway? Um, I think we're seeing a, um, a great mixing of some of the up and coming talent in Silicon Valley that has made a real difference over the past decade. Um, that has really you know, made, made the internet social media, the cloud, part of everyone's everyday life. And we're seeing that intersecting with the, um, like I said, the internet secret sauce of peering that, that keeps the whole thing hanging together. So it's not just the usual faces here, um, it's new people and the new people interacting with the, uh, the longer time people. And I think that's, um, you know, it's... And setting the agenda for conversations to be yeah. discussed, right? Yeah, Technical absolutely. Technical and business. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I agree, uh, well said. I mean, you know, the people who have made it happen really giving back with their own time in the foundation to train and get educated, but also keep their eye on the prize, which is freedom, want <laughs> more access, right? Um, this is theCUBE, thanks for coming on, really appreciate it. That's a great perspective, looking at the DNS, looking at the international global landscape. This is theCUBE, of course we are flat, we're global. We just send the signal out and see where it goes. And I'm um, John Furrier with Jeff Frick here, live in Silicon Valley in Palo Alto for Pew.O. We'll be right back after this short break.